We are all very conscious of the presence of the Lord, aren't we? Someone asked me, and she said, what are you going to share uh, this afternoon? And I said, hash. And she said, oh, well, I like hash. I said, well, you serve steak over there, and I'll serve hash over here. Because rather than take a portion of scripture only and exegete it in some fashion for you that would be acceptable and, and perhaps even profitable, I feel the Lord wants to say a lot of different things. Can you handle that? A young lady came over here a while ago and uh, spoke to me and then gave me something to, to look at later. And I was trying to see who she was. I didn't recognize her. She's a little kid last time I remember. And uh, she's got a kid of her own now. So I'm no longer mama in Israel. And I think I may be going from grandma to great grandma. So it is with that heart that I'm sharing with you what I'm gonna share right now. Are you ready to hear this? Can, do you hear my heart? There's no curse upon the bride of Christ once we are one in him. There's no curse upon womanhood or man. The only curse that exists is the curse against Satan since Calvary. For the curse is what? Broken says the New Testament, and we are set free. We come into Christ, and we are free from any curse. So we don't have to dwell on, on absolutes of the curse didn't mean this and it did mean that. And if you do, you're gonna get hurt. And that's what I'm trying to prevent for you. And once you get hurt, two things happen. One, the vessel is injured, and it takes a season of time for it to heal. And two, the opportunities of the ground on which you would pour become closed. Do you understand it? I'm presuming to be talking to women in leadership here this afternoon, and that's the way I'm talking to you. Now, if you got set free and, and appreciate yourself anew and afresh as a woman, and you were raised in a church that taught you you were continually under the curse and so on, then I'm glad you heard it because you needed to hear that. You are not under the curse. The New Testament teaches submission by choice. Oh yes, look the word out. The word submit to your husbands means this, choose to come under. That's New Testament. The uh, indication there is you don't have to. You don't have to have him rule over you under a curse. It's love, love, love. Everything in New Testament is love. And because we love, we choose. Does, does that clarify it? And it just brings, all I wanted to do is just kind of bring the balance of that because inevitably, understand with me that Satan has no qualms about using scripture to do his evil deeds. And that's the last thing I wanted to happen to you, was for you to pick, pick up a piece of truth that was liberating to you and rush out and start trying to preach it and share it somewhere and have all those doors closed to you. And I thought, all right, I'm gonna take that liberty to do it. So, will you receive it in love? Thank you. 1,500 years ago, St. Augustine made these comments and they're worthy of our hearing. We are Christians for our own sakes. We are leaders for your sake. The fact that we are Christians should serve us. The fact that we are leaders should serve you. Did it sink all the way in? You must see that because otherwise you will not understand a good portion of my message with and to you this afternoon if you will feel more comfortable having your Bibles open, you may open them, open them to 16th chapter of Romans. I'm only going to look at one verse here, but it's good to start with a word, isn't it? The 16th chapter of Romans is a woman's favored book anyway, or chapter, because it is in this that Paul lists so many women who labored with him. It begins like this, Paul making this statement, Paul who is thought to be prejudiced against women. 
ridiculous, but that's what we've been taught because of those two seeming no-no verses in Corinthians and Timothy, neither of which mean what some people have told us they mean. They are corrective verses for disturbances in the church on one occasion and protective verse in Timothy. He says, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority. And the clue there is, I don't let women usurp authority and I don't let them teach others to usurp authority. Now that needs to be taught to us, and if you're honest, you'll say amen to that. Because we have a tendency, and we are known for it, give them an inch. <laughs> and so Paul said, don't let them usurp authority. There has to be some headship, there has to be some authority. And I, for one, don't really want to come apart from all of that, do you? I like, I like that, that there is organization in the church. I like being able to, to submit, and there's no feeling of, we don't need these guys getting them out, and we can do this with our, by ourselves. The body of Christ should never have that feeling, whether male or female. And may I suggest to you, and it's not really a suggestion, it's... <clears throat> <laughs> may I suggest it's a nicer way of saying it than an indictment, I started to say, that if indeed, you feel that way, get them out of here, we'll take over, you are prejudiced. And you are blaming them for prejudice that you possess. All right? The first verse says, Paul speaking, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sencria. I want to talk to us for a few moments about servants because we have a misconcept of servanthood the bible speaks of servant 491 times in the bible it must be fairly important in fact that is um, if i remember accurately i took that just from john if i'm not mistaken 491 times from, and, and service is spoken of 132 times. Now, if it's so often spoken of, what is it that we do with it that's not right? And I'll show you. Our concept of servanthood is that that's where you begin in order to get someplace else. Most people who read Verse 1 of chapter 16 of Romans would declare that the only reason Phoebe had any recognition was because she was a servant of the church. And it is possible that there are some of you who are not called by God into leadership, but you are called by your own need to have acceptance and recognition in the church. And if that is true, I promise you, you are being misused and abused. You've set it up, but it's happening to you. Did it get through? And every time anything is needed to be done, they know who to call on. And pretty soon you find yourself in a spiral unending activities and expectations that you can no longer keep up with. Your home suffers. You suffer. Maybe you're without family. They're, they're quick to abuse. Widows. Unmarried. You don't have a family. You do it. And it absolutely will end up in one of two things. You will either mature which I'm going to do my very best to help you come to today. Or you will one day cease it all and either walk out of the church or begin to sit in the back row disgruntled and discouraged because you don't understand what happened. Yes? It is natural, and listen, it is more natural for women than men to want to serve. I personally think it's all tied up in maternal instincts. I'm not sure of that, but I think it is. Women just want to serve. 
Women especially, if any love or appreciation is shown us, we just give and give and give and give. It's, it's part of our makeup, I believe. But women, if they're going to move and emerge into leadership, and we are in a new decade, and we are in a new moment, and we are in a new generation, every one of us that are alive today are in, have entered this new generation. And if we're to move to leadership, we're going to have to learn how to set the limits. Are you there? Because others will never set them for you. Servanthood is the state of being a servant. And it is not something we enter into for a season of time until we can become something greater. It is something we live always and forever. The question is not how long will we serve. The question is whom shall we serve? You may serve your local assembly. And that may be the total point of your loyalty. And it's a good one. But you will get injured if that's your goal. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? At some point, someone there will disappoint you. And when that happens, then you'll flow in the whole towel and be through with the hole. You can serve the people. But if you serve the people, they will begin to order you. How many times do we read when Paul is writing of himself, half a dozen at least, I, Paul, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, can you imagine how angry his captors must have been to hear him say that? Can't you see the soldiers as they declare, we hold Paul, the apostle captive? And Paul says, no one holds me captive. I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of the negatives and derogatory concept about serving will be done away with when you understand who it is you serve. Does that make sense? <laughs> Darling, if you don't see this down the line, you're going to say, I wish I'd listened. I wish I'd heard. And some of you are already injured. You've already been hurt in, in the midst of serving. And it's because you, you set your loyalties here and instead of here on a horizontal basis. The horizontal activity is only an expression of the servanthood that is spoken of in the word. Does that make sense? Yeah. Nod your head this way if I don't make sense. Because I'll just say, I won't embarrass you. But I want you to understand me this afternoon. I am serving you at this moment. I really, the best I know how, I'm endeavoring to bring to you on the best platter I can bring you, the best food that I have to give you. But the only reason I'm willing to do that, do you understand that, is this way. I really don't expect it back from you. I'm his. Phil Kerr wrote a song years ago, and it says, I'm his to command where he leads me. I'm his to command when he needs me. Whatever befall, I'll give him my all because I'm his. I'm his to command. That's what I want to be your cry this day. I'm his to command. That will stop all of the anger and the sense of I'm not being used right and that hierarchical positional authority that we've grown up with, it infiltrates the world and seeps into the church. Longevity earns a right to be heard, says the world. Yes or no? And so we feel if we've been here longer than anyone else, they had better not be promoted over us. <laughs> or we'll quit and we'll find a little pond in which to float. It is true. It has to be true unless, 
unless we have deprived ourselves, as was said so beautifully today, of the rights. You have a right to be angry if someone's promoted over you, if your trust is in longevity, and if you call longevity faithfulness, which it isn't always. I'll wait for that one to get all the way down to your toes. I know people that have been in the church since it started, and they've not yet become faithful. They're just there. Hello. Faithfulness is reaching out and touching him and growing in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul says, I commend unto you, Phoebe. Most of you know that this very book would never reach Rome without her. Phoebe's the one that took the book of Romans to Rome. Paul was in prison. The book needed to get there. Trust a woman. We do find ways to get things done, don't we? Great was the company of women that published it. Servant. In the book of Joshua, we read that Joshua was Moses' servant. Ah, yes, but Joshua then became, as soon as Moses died, Joshua became number one. Not because he earned it, he never was worthy of it, are we? It wasn't his faithfulness to serve Moses that allowed him the credibility that God chose him. It wasn't because he'd been there longer than anyone else. It was because Joshua knew God in the new generation the way Moses knew him in the old. Doesn't that change the picture? God would have picked anyone else if he needed to and let Joshua sit and pout. Oh, I served him. But it was Joshua that was out there in the battle learning warfare, learning it's our God that helps us win the victories and the battles. Now, I'm going to be bold. I know that doesn't really shock most of you. <laughs> One of the problems with the church today is that we have too many people in the pulpits who have been promoted there by longevity and service to anointed men and women of God, but not to the God of the anointed men and women. When I was thinking of, of talking to you, I kept hearing generation, generation, and I thought, well, God, that's the message I give to mothers, that's not to leaders. And then I began to hear it coming out in each of the messages today. And I realized, yes, it must come back to leaders as well. God today is not focusing on denominations. He's not even focusing on nations. We're the ones who make the divisions. God so loved the world. God today is focusing on a generation. This living generation. Those of us on the way out of it, those who are just barely coming into it, and those who are right in the center of it are all seen as one right now. He's wanting whatever wisdom has come by living and knowledge and learning to be brought to the younger ones so they can bring it to the younger. That's the whole principle of mothering, teaching those at our feet to know our God not our legalism. Yeah, but they don't want to hear anything. I'm weary of that excuse. I travel all over the world, and I'm sure that every place I go and minister, there are some who do not want to hear what I say. I'm sure of that. I don't believe it, but I'm sure of it. <laughs> sent there for them and I can't listen to me please hear it I can't always spot them anyway you think you can you think that the one that is sitting there <laughs> is rejecting I used to think I could spot them 
And I've come to see some of those come up to me afterwards and say, I just got five answers that I'd been asking God for. And I think, you did? <laughs> you certainly don't show it. <laughs> While the person across the room, every time you look at them, is going, You know what I'm saying? The Bible says wheat and tares grow up together. Don't you do the picking. And that's why several cults started by women came into being because they gathered a little group around them who were willing to swallow anything they said and began to just feed it to them. If my servanthood begins vertically and remains vertically, I only go where he sends me, and the only thing I am is his mouth or his servant. Do you understand that? All I have to do is please him. It isn't my responsibility to cram this into your craw. How many of you in this conference have heard and understood some things that you know you heard before and rejected because you didn't comprehend. Look, look around, I want you to see these. Is that beautiful? To me, that's beautiful. I have people say to me frequently, I've heard, uh, uh, when I first heard you, I just met the Lord and I didn't hear, I didn't understand anything you said. But this time, what I'm saying is, when I serve him, I'm not responsible for results. I'm responsible for serving. And I don't have a right to say they didn't want to hear it, so I didn't give it to them. I hear leaders say this, whoa, whoa. If the Lord said give it, just give it. The same thing is true of a prophetic word. When you give a prophetic word, don't run around behind it and say, did that make sense? Did that make sense? If you don't know it's gonna make sense, don't give it. Your problem is you want it to make sense to you, and the word isn't to you. Unless it's given publicly, and then it better make sense to you before you give it, or as you give it. Did that carry through? So Joshua served Moses. It's in the serving of Moses that he gets to know God. He knows God so well, he can hear the voice of God. Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. And now I'm gonna call you. That isn't something I don't believe that Joshua aspired to. He knew it was gonna happen. He had this anointing placed upon him long before. He heard it prophetically stated to him. I don't think he's living his whole life waiting, all right, you sick yet? Moses, God saying anything about retire? <laughs> Yet I meet a lot of people in the church that are just waiting for somebody to get transferred. <laughs> How big is our God? Is the God who called you big enough to place you? Amen. Yes, but he won't place you anywhere until you're functioning where you are. No, he won't. No, he won't. Well, I'm just waiting on the Lord. No, you're not. You're just stagnating. What are you doing where you are? Not long ago, some members of my own staff approached me with an excellent plan. It really was an excellent plan. And they wanted to answer some needs that had been written in them going certain places and doing certain things. And they were just, all right, they had all met when I was out in the field and decided this was an excellent plan, and then I came home. And they were presenting it to me, and I said, do you really think you can accomplish this? Oh, yes! I said, then do it here. Here? Yes, because I'm sending no one out who can't make it happen here. Is that tough? Seemed tough to them. Seemed real tough to them. 
fact, a couple of them suggested that they could go to their local churches. I don't have a church, I have a training center. We don't meet on Sundays. Every, all members of my staff, all 120 of them, go to other churches in the area. If they could go to their local church and be sent out, I said, go ahead. That's not my responsibility. Do you hear what I'm saying? I, I'm talking to leaders. We first of all need to understand this. If I can't make it happen in my own life, I don't have a right to share this with you. No, I don't. I do not have a right to preach platitudes to you at all. I do have a right to share life experiences and to come and say the word says and here's how I've seen it activated through my life. Yes, I'm a servant of the church, but the only reason I'm a servant of the church is because I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. That's all, that's all. I didn't choose it as a vocation. I'm smarter than that, <laughs> but I delight in it because it pleases him. Please understand the need to understand that. And Joshua moved on because he knew that. I love what Peter says about himself in 2 Peter in chapter one, he says, I, Peter, now listen to the order he uses, a servant and an apostle. Don't hear that too often today, do you? We, we might hear, I'm an apostle. I'm a prophet. I'm an evangelist. I'm a pastor. I'm a teacher. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we started out the way Peter did? I, Peter, a servant and an apostle. That takes all the sting out of authority. All of the hurt out of submission. It's easy to submit to someone who's a servant of the Most High God. Jude, presumably by most theologians, to be the brother, the literal brother of Jesus Christ through Joseph, of course, addresses his book by saying, I, Jude, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I find that interesting. <laughs> He doesn't say a brother, though spiritually even, we have a right to say he's our brother. Do you understand? Does this making sense? I guess, and, and I'm trying not to use the word, I'm trying to use the, the thought of humility without using the word, because when we get caught up in humility, it usually ends up in pride. I almost never hear a message on humility that doesn't end in pride. You know what I mean? It convinces us if we'll be humble enough, God will raise us up. All right! <laughs> so I'm trying not to use that word. I'm trying to help us understand that at our highest, at our highest positional, at our highest anointing, which is powerful anointing, we are servants. Yeah. We never shed it. Yeah. Oh, someone's thinking, oh, but Jesus said, I don't call you servants, I call you friends. So we're not really servants. No, he's talking about slavery. I don't call you slaves. How many of you, and you don't have to lift your hands, but how many of you remember when you worked for the Lord because you feared hell? <laughs> That's slavery, right? I gotta make these bricks or I don't live. <laughs> That's slavery. Jesus says, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking to you about uh, you have to serve me. I'm talking about that you choose. And therefore, I choose you as friends. And I won't treat you like a slave who doesn't need to know why they dig a hole and then fill it up. I'm going to tell you what I do. I'm going to make known to you my ways. Hello? Now, why am I saying all of these things? Because do you remember when Samuel was given by his mother to serve the Lord? Every year she took him something. What was it? A coat. Why every year? He outgrew last year's coat. Why don't we know that about people? 
We're trying today to do the same thing we did 10 years ago with people. Trying to preach the same things on the same level and have the same kind of altar calls, the same kinds of responses. Trying to take people back to the early charismatic days of sing and dance. And mind you, that now, now keep, please stay with me through the whole thing so you don't go out with just one little thing and misquote. I'm bad enough when I'm quoted accurately. <laughs> Do I believe in singing and dance? Yes. Do I believe in prayer lines at times? Do I believe in, yes, 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 yes. But I believe they should progress. Do you? Yes. And if you're to be a leader today, number one, you must recognize you're a prisoner first. I can do nothing less but serve him. That's a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Number two, as a prisoner of the Lord, I will serve him as he wishes, desires, wants, and leads. I will not pick and choose where I will serve or how long I will serve through eternity. Have you got that straight? So if you're sitting in one position, aspiring to another, you are abusing your privilege. If you're teaching junior Sunday school class, longing to teach the adults, you're missing the blessing of today. That's, right. That's what I'm trying to say. Take a look at those juniors and say, Lord, help me to see what they can become. I could change the world if I had enough juniors. Trust me, I know I could. Because kids today don't mind being radical. They're fearless. Once they get the point, they're fearless. You, if you were wise, those, especially those of you who pastor, you'd start focusing on the younger generation. Get them moving out in the streets. Get them witnessing. I've been telling inner city churches, get gangs witnessing. Don't send them out by twos. Send them out by twenties. In blue jeans and sweatshirts. Walking the streets threatening. Why not? Well, that isn't the way Jesus did it. That was 2,000 years ago. You want to go back to 2,000 years ago? That's where some churches are today. That's why they're not doing anything. Why don't we get creative? We can decorate everything but witnessing. Cakes and rooms and... Isn't it about time for us to bring our creativity into that? What if we got a whole bunch of kids together and took them down the inner city, dressed like I said, just looking for something, looking for action. And they just move up. Somebody's gonna ask them, who are you? Are you guys a gang? You better believe that. A group of people is a gang. <laughs> Wanna know our philosophy? Why well, know who we stand for? We're here to break up problems out here on the streets. Give your kids something to live for. Amen. Amen. Instead of bringing them to church and talking about their generation being all hell bent. Amen. Teach them how to counter that thing. Amen. Have prayer with them before they go. Amen. And a thousand other ideas that might come to your head just now. Is that making sense to you? That's what leadership is. When I was a young girl, they gave me a Sunday school class of three, three junior girls. I took a look at that class, and I got charged. Got, and some of them, a couple of them weren't saved. We got them saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And they were from unsaved homes, so we went after their parents. We got the parents saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And they went after relatives, and we got more kids in the class. And pretty soon I had 30 kids in my class. So they split the class and gave me the small group, and I got charged. <laughs> Honest, I'm not exaggerating. I'm telling you absolute truth. That's all God's looking for from you. Instead of, oh, well, if I had an opportunity. Come on! You've got an opportunity if you're breathing. <laughs> Our 
problem is, number one, we don't understand leadership. We really don't. We still think it's some positional authority. Leadership is simply going somewhere with someone following you. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of problem of the problem is, and you're not going anywhere. Here's another problem. Oh, you're gonna hate this. I forgive you. <laughs> Some of the people that you were leader of followed you until they outgrew you. And the coat got too tight for them to wear. So in order to grow, they had to leave you and go to someone who knew how to make a bigger coat. Thank you for receiving that. You want a place to minister, whether you're talking public ministry or ministry of any nature, then grow. Because as you grow, there are thousands of others who are longing to find the way to the next move, the next step. Why are you here? Why are you at this conference? It's because you're hoping, you're longing, you're believing. There are some who have grown enough to lead you into the next step. And that's what we're committed to do. But there are many behind you, darling, that need the same treatment. You don't have to come clear out here in order to lead people. You only have to be a half a step ahead in order to lead. But you do have to be a half a step ahead. And you got to keep walking and keep growing and apply. You see, I'm not, I don't want to just leave you with words. Between every level of growth is a plateau of God's dealings. And that's when decisions to grow or not grow are made. I'm going along and I'm, I'm it. Don't you love being God's it? Learn to enjoy it. It doesn't last long. And I'm God's it. And, and there's nobody that knows much more than I do. And so here I am, and I just move it. And, uh, all right, you're all coming behind. And go back and find the babies and lead them up to this point again, because you'll never take away what I already have. I watch people do this. They'll walk along. I'm going to move. I have to tell the cameraman when I'm going to move. I'm going to move. I walk along. <laughs> And you're following me, and I get to this plateau, and God deals with me, and I say, no. I'm tired changing. I'm pretty good the way I am. <laughs> and pretty soon, you guys, you ladies, you pass me. Bye-bye. And on you go, and there's another leader ahead that said yes on this plateau. And you follow them. Now, I can either stand here and quit. Oh, yes, lots of them have. Yes. They're selling insurance. <laughs> <laughs> or I can go clear back here to some new brand new babies and say, I know the way. Follow me. And I'm I'm it again. Because they don't know different. Wonder why church grows this far, stops, splits? Grows this far, stops, splits? You begin to get a picture? Yes. Want to know why your class does? Want to know why a glow groups, whatever you're involved in? It's because the leaders aren't progressing. And there's a longing like I've never seen in the body today. I want to know God. <laughs> Oh, yes, I don't deny anything I have here. I don't deny anything I found here. I don't deny anything I found here. But there's more. Every plateau you stop at will demand new healings for you. Yes, it will. New forgivenesses. New remembrances. Coming face to face with past. Don't you hate it? Aren't you glad he doesn't tell us we have to love it? We just don't despise it. 
Don't despise the chastening. Don't say love it. Because a lot of things we claim we dealt with in the past, we simply deny. Yes. Yes. They don't exist, they don't exist, they don't exist. It doesn't exist. I am not there. It was not a problem. <laughs> and then one day, there they are on the street. Hi there! <laughs> Because God is going to so cleanse every leader that there's not a person on earth or in heaven that we cannot meet with a clean conscience. Yes, he is. And if you're still back here nursing your pains, you're just on a plateau. Don't beat yourself half to death. You're just, you're just there. You're not going anywhere to get it all together. You can go backwards, pick up the babies. You don't mind me using you as the babies, do you? You can go backwards and pick up the babies and bring them as far as you are, and they'll kiss you goodbye and go. But you'll never move from there. You'll always be known as a person that has that ministry. That's where we started picking up, I have the ministry of. That's a critique on us. It's a dangerous thing to say, my ministry is. Because what it says is, I came to a certain place and I'm staying here where it's comfortable. Well, let me clarify. How many of you think Paul was an apostle? You don't think he was an apostle? Do you read the book? <laughs> How many of you think I maybe think Paul was a prophet. I maybe think Paul was an evangelist. How maybe think Paul was a missionary? Well, now, wait a minute, who is this guy? How maybe you think Paul was a pastor? That's how he began. What are you? Oh, well, we're not in the five fall, we're women. Okay, forget the five fold. Now what are you? <laughs> Paul's high calling was that of a prisoner. When he went to identify himself, he said, I'm a prisoner. Oh, one time he got a little hot under the collar and said, I am an apostle. <laughs> Just because I wasn't alive when, when, when you guys think I should have seen Jesus, I saw him. But outside of that, he doesn't brag on it a lot. I have for years called myself a platter. I say the same God that takes the clay can make a dog dish or a platter. <laughs> it all depends on how it's molded <laughs> and what it's used for. Are you there? Does that make sense? Say, no, don't do it to yourself, what you're doing. I don't have the education, I don't have the background, I don't have the heritage, I don't have. It isn't, as it was said so well today, it isn't what you don't have, it's what do you have. Yes, yes, yes. And it's who you serve, yes. and whose you are, yes. and how much captive to him you are. He can do anything with me he wants, yes. then why are you fighting him where you are? <laughs> well, because I have no outlet. Let me ask those of you who really honestly have convinced yourself that there is no opportunity for you to minister. Let me ask you this. How much time do you spend in praise? Ministry begins in ministering unto the Lord. When Noah was floating along in the ark, He had one window. It was upward. Isn't it time for us to begin to look up and start every day with, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto thee, not the church, unto thee. 
If any man, any human, lack wisdom, let him ask of God who upbraideth not, but giveth to all men liberally. Do we need wisdom? Oh yes, many of us have slammed our own doors. Oh yes, maybe men came along and locked them, but we slammed them. <laughs> and I believe it's time for women to understand the incredible need for wisdom. Wisdom to know when to speak and when to be silent. Wisdom to know what to say. Just because you know it doesn't mean you have to say it. Because we are going to be used of God to counter women's lives. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. All of that negativism and, and the attack of Satan. Look at the whole uh, murdering scene of abortion. That's the attack on women today. Women fighting. I just came from a church somewhere. And I was ministering, and the pastor called me in the afternoon. He said, Everett, I need to talk to you. He came over and said, I want to tell you this. He said, I just wrote a letter last week or so to my congressman, congresswoman, actually. And he said, I, I sent a picture of an unborn fetus that was in the third term and shows the anguish that it goes through during the abortion. And he said, I, I told her what we stood for. He said, I got a very hostile reply through the mail. And I wondered, well, you know, is he hurt over this? What's he telling me for? And he said, uh, the follow-up of that is a phone call today in which she states she has turned me in for child pornography. And he said, this is going to hit the papers real soon. And he said, I want you to pray with me for wisdom. While I was there in that city, it hit the papers. So-and-so, Reverend so-and-so, under federal investigation, because he sent the picture of the unborn feet. You want to tell me there's no war against women today? There's war. Satan has literally got his filth tied around women and making them believe that the church and anything Christ-like is anti-women. Men aren't going to change that. We are. Instead of we coming alongside and saying, oh, I know what you mean. They kept us down too. Let's begin to take the liberties where we are. Let's flow as mothers and as wives and as singles. Let's begin to flow in, in whatever opportunities God has put before us. Let's get outside the doors of a church and minister. Yes. Take the meat to the street. Yes. You've heard it over and over. Why don't we do it? Because we've believed a lie that says we're not capable or that's someone else's job. We don't understand leadership. Number two, we don't, we not only don't understand it, we don't utilize it. Every woman in this room holds a sphere of influence and that makes you a leader. That's right. You affect somebody. In fact, statistics some years back said we affect seven to ten people every day of our lives. That's pretty powerful. I'm not even touching intercessory prayer. That goes without being preached, doesn't it? But the way you look at people, the way you smile, you've heard some of us tell about situations as we travel. The postman, the package deliverer, the checker in the grocery store. The people you walk by on the street. I was, I was walking with a friend of mine in Disneyland. We went into a, one of the gift shops and we're looking through. And a lady walked up to me and she said to me, excuse me, and I turned, I said, yes. And she said, could you help me? I said, honey, I don't work here. She said, well, I didn't mean that kind of help. And she begins to pour this thing out and I talked to her and had prayer with her. And my friend said, do you know her? I said, no. She said, well, why'd she ask you? <laughs> Are you there? Yes. 
See, if they took the pulpit from me, they couldn't stop me ministering. We need to learn to utilize it and find God's strategy for situations. Why don't we just go over these things? Why don't we start seeking? God, how can I reach my town? How can I reach my community? How can I reach my area? My sphere of influence? What would be divine strategy? How can I make a difference? Begin to teach our young people. How can you do it in school? And then we need to understand unified leadership. It's not whether I lead or you lead or you lead. It's everyone who's capable should lead. Joshua, you're going over in three days. I always think that's amusing. For 40 years, they've been talking about it. And now God gives them a three-day extension. Why do they need three days? Well, if you read the book, he tells you. First of all, the people only talk it. They don't expect it. They don't expect to go over and fight, to possess. So he says, all of those mighty men of war, have them put on their uniforms and have them walk by the people. There's nothing like hearing a testimony from someone who just won to stir us up, right? So here come all the mighty men of war and they're full array, passing through, onward Christian soldiers. And all the people say, yeah, yeah, rah, 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 woo. <laughs> That's what we do when we come together. That's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing with you. We're rah, rah, rah. Getting you moving. <laughs> saying, yeah, if he did it through us, he can do it through you. God wants to do a new thing today. And you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to say amen? Yeah. <laughs> then he says, Joshua. Tell the people to prepare vittles. Prepare vittles to go to war? We're going to have a picnic or a war? <laughs> Why do they have to prepare vittles? Because for 40 years they hadn't. It just rained down from heaven. And they picked it up and ate it and griped. I really believe the Lord is saying, prepare vittles. Get yourself in the book. Get yourself in the word. Learn to fix your own meals. You'll never be led astray if you know what the book says. You'll be able to do your own sifting. You'll be able to say, this I accept from that speaker, this I don't. This is what God's word says. This is not what God's word says. Prepare vittles and get ready to go on over. That's where we are. We're preparing a generation to move. Do you understand that? It's going to be the former and the latter reign. I mean, honestly, we're moving into that third day. We're not just hyping you. We're trying to prepare you. We're trying to say something new is about to happen, and the church isn't ready. So it isn't my church or well, your church. It's his church that makes the difference. Turn with me to 2 Kings, chapter 2, verse 19. The men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not. And the ground is barren. Things look good. But the water is not pure. And the result is the land is barren. Beautiful but barren. Interesting. The same thing was said of Sarah. Beautiful but barren. Is it fair to suggest that might be the status or the state of the church today? Why is it that most of our reports of great reproduction 
come from overseas because the city here looks so good. We have big churches, metro churches, little churches, successful churches, numerically, financially, educationally, musically. We know everything there is to know in worshiping as far as how-tos. If there's a how-to we haven't done, we haven't learned what it is. True or false? We're so good at what we do, we don't have to think about it. I wonder if there isn't a cry that says, the city looks good, but the water that flows isn't pure. And the result is, there's a leader present here. When the situation is called to his attention, he says this, number one, bring me a new cruise. Number two, put salt in it. New wine, is that what we're talking about here? New water, new wine, pure water, pure wine. What does God pour it into? New cruises, new wine skins, if you want the absolute terms. We're bringing old wine skins to him and saying, we want the new wine. And he says, if I poured new wine, in those old skins, it'd break you up. You couldn't handle it. That's why I dare to say, and I know it might sound startling to some of you, that the church isn't ready for the very move that's on its way, the breath of God. I felt God said to me earlier in this year, I've dealt with seasons and I've dealt with moments between seasons and I've dealt with hours, but now my move is just a breath away. If I heard accurately, that's pretty exciting. Just a breath away from the great move, all of the things we've heard prophesied and promised to us. God says, I'm gonna do it. I got some people that are ready. My cry is, oh no, not just for some. I don't just want to move to come through one denomination. Not this time. Do you? No. Not this time. Not just to one group. Not just to one age level. Not this time. Oh, God, no. Listen to me. Not just to one nation. Not this time, God, no. Let it be thy kingdom come. Thy will be done throughout the world and our work is cut out for us as leaders, and we must begin quickly to take some steps to prepare people. Amen. New wineskins. And let it begin in me. That's the end of a phrase of a song that says, Lord, send a revival. Lord, send a revival. Lord, send a revival. And let it begin in you willing to be changed, stretched? Not the old little wineskin we once were. Well, praise the Lord, I can minister salvation and baptism in the Holy Spirit. Glory to God, that's my ministry. Woo, I love to lay hands on people and watch them fill with the Holy Spirit. Good, that's a byproduct of everything else. That's a beginning to get ready to commence, to start. It's not an end, right? He says, come on, I'll stretch you. I said, if you stretch me, I'll break. He said, no, first I'll water you. <laughs> and he begins to pour, and this old skin gets softer. I love you, Lord. <laughs> and I lift my voice, and oh, I feel him, and I feel the pliability to my life. And at that moment, I love everyone. I look at people that have hurt me, I love you, I love you, love, love, love. I may know what I'm saying. When you're in his presence, you love everyone. And then he starts this. <laughs> stretching, stretching, stretching until I think I can't stretch anymore. 
I'm so far ahead of where I was, I'm wonderful. It just takes new cruises and us. Jesus said, ye are the salt. You know the purpose of salt is to make people thirsty. <laughs> How thirsty do they, do they get because of you? How many people watch your life and say, oh, I'd love to have what you have? That's what he meant. Yeah, we don't just preserve the whole thing as salt. We create thirst. Hmm? Oh, I wish I could have the strength you seem to have. I wish I could have the peace and circumstances that you obviously do. I wish I could be as gracious to others as you are. I wish I could hold my temper like you do. That's witness. Yeah, amen. Amen. That's salt. Amen. And the word says, I'll pour in the water and it'll be pure. Well, accurately, here's what he says. I'll give you the source of the water. He'll be in you a well of living water. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he says, when it comes out of you, out of your belly, Amen. innermost being, the same word is translated womb, out of your reproductive capacity, shall flow rivers of living, living. What was wrong with the land? It was barren because nothing living was hitting it. That's why we want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why he says, I have to stretch you and change you and rearrange you and get you bigger so you can contain more because the whole land has been barren. But he says, I want it to become fruitful. Turn on over to chapter 4, verse 38. Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servant, one of them, set on the great pot and seize pottage for these Bible students. And one went out, into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it wild gourds, his lap full, and came and shared them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. He didn't know what he had. So they poured out for the men to eat. And it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out and said, Oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. What's the situation? Bible school students, sons of the prophets, learning the prophetic ministry, hungry. Elisha says, let's feed these young men. And his servants go out to gather mushrooms, we would say. Come across a plant that is unknown to him, but has the appearance of being edible. Good for you. And gathers a whole lapful, brings it back, and before it is tried, it is shared. You're beautiful. I didn't know if you'd get that. That's great. And it is instant poison to their systems. How many times have we seen truth served this way? Little bit of truth. They had the, the meal was there. The porridge was there. Little bit of truth. But when a little bit of truth has added to it, a lot of poisonous, untried substance that wasn't sought out and studied and understood and looked at. You there? It produced death. If you don't understand this, please don't try to. Just leave it. 
because this is for those who understand. And that's no put down. Honest, it's not. Honestly, it's not. But, but the ones that need it really need it. Be careful, ladies, that you don't pick up something someone says and start preaching it before you even check it out. What's he going to do about this? We've got a very bad situation. We have a death threat here. He says, well, I'll tell you what we need to do. We need to bring something that will counter this. It's called meal. Ground wheat. Ground flour. The word, if you like. The word. The word that's been chewed. Huh? That make any sense? That which we have masticated, chewed and swallowed and appropriated into our living levels. He said, bring the meal and put it in the pot. Isn't that interesting? The only thing we have to do when the counterfeit is causing death is bring the real. <laughs> Glory to God. That's what he's called us here to do. He's called us here to say, don't pick up little gimmicks and ideas and things that sound good and go out here and start circulating with them. What I want you to do is bring the meal, that which is a part of your life. Grind it up, make it real, see if it brought life to you. And then bring that back to the pot. That's what you have to serve. That's what I'll eat from you. You've heard speakers say all the right things and somehow it just didn't ring, haven't you? Because so, you didn't know why, but something inside of you said, this, I don't know, it doesn't ring true. It very well may be that that person is nothing more than a parrot of someone else. You want to be successful in ministry? Learn to eat it. It's out of our breasts that the milk comes forth from that which we've already been partakers of. You can't get ideas and stories and gimmicks and, and commentaries and prepare messages and spit them out at people and expect your gift to make room. Because the church has grown up, especially in the United States. And they're not just buying everything like they used to. And they're looking to find those who know what they're talking about. And they're, when they do, there's just a tendency to just it all in. What's the purpose? The purpose is life. Now look at verse 21. In verse 21, chapter 2. He went forth to the spring of waters, cast the salt in there, and, and said, listen to what he says. Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. Now, wait a minute. Who healed the waters? Elisha's the one that had the plan. He looked at the situation. He says, bring me a new cruise, something not contaminated. Bring me the salt. He went forth to the springs, he put it in there, and they were healed. And now God takes the credit. <laughs> I'm so glad you can laugh. Because unfortunately, that is the attitude of some ministers, is that they did it. They found this truth. They had this revelation. We don't have it. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth once. He said, what do you have you haven't been given? It's not my ministry. It's not my revelation. When we sing to God be the glory, we mean it. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. When God gives you the strategy for your city, your area, whatever you're in, your family, and it works, you can't go out and preach that strategy because it won't work somewhere else. That's why the church is frustrated today. We're trading gimmicks. What worked for this church 
and made them a total success, other people are coming and saying, now what did, how much salt did you put in there? How big was the cruise? Hello? And they're going home and measuring. What would that plant look like, the one that was deaf? What was that wrong thing? Well, it, it had red leaves and, and purple flower, and it looked like this. So they go home and cut out all red leaves and purple flowers. Or all choirs. Yes, yes, and all the dancing. And people still are barren, and people still die. Yes. And they throw the whole thing out and say it didn't work. Are you there? Because it's God. We are his prisoners, his servants. He's in charge. It's his church, not ours. It's his word, not ours. It's his revelation, not ours. Even your children, he calls his. Oh yeah, read the Old Testament. He says, you better treat them right or I'm gonna get you. That's what the Old Testament says. These are my children. He says, you don't have a right. He was talking to a whole nation. He said, you don't have a right to offer my children to Baal, to false God. You have a right to, he said, they're my children. So we're pretty quickly reduced to all that I am and all that I have belongs to him. If you have that attitude this afternoon, then you're ready to be used of God wherever, whenever, or even not to be publicly ever used of God. You can't not be used of God. If you belong to him, you're his knife and fork. You're his, his pawn on his chessboard. He's gonna place you strategically wherever he wants you to be. And if you spend your whole life war, I wanted to be the queen that did the checkmate. <laughs> then we will miss the blessing of a pond. It's a wonderful thing to know that while I'm just a little nothing here on this chessboard of God, and there are big, wonderful people out here doing great and wonderful things, they couldn't say checkmate without me. I may be just one drop in the bucket, but it won't get full without me. Are you there? So, Lord, here we are. We're ready to be used of God in any way you want to use us. And we're ready to grow so that we can wear a new coat every year and create a new coat every year as leaders for those who grow into them.